can't believe that i couldn't find anywhere honestly that would do like a t-shirt just on its own like a sample like everywhere was we yeah, yeah, you know, minimum order of certain stuff and i was like i don't want to do a 200 hundred dollar order or so yeah and go from there no, it was bizarre man that was bizarre so it was like a drug deal but for a t-shirt uh yeah pretty pretty much not that i know what that feels like but i've, I've seen them in movies let's talk oculus is proudly sponsored by the good folks at patreon if you want to support the show join us on patreon.com forward slash playtest vr what's up oculus nerds i'm dan from playtest vr welcome back to episode 42 of let's talk oculus now of course i'm joined by samson he is repping one of the first i mean me probably the first ever lto merch so what you got here there? it is here it is very comfortable very warm yeah he is um he is wearing the premium lto hoodie um perfect i wish you could turn around and do the whole you know fashion show but you're all mic'd up and such so maybe not today yeah i'd get, I'd get tangled <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and we're today we're joined by a special guest. He is the game director at Sponge Games, uh, currently working on the hit App Lab title, uh, App Lab title, uh, Dead Second. Sean Edwards, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Very good, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on here to have a chat. Awesome, awesome. As you can tell by his yeah. voice, Sean's all the way in Australia, so we're recording this two G'day, separate mate. days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're on a Saturday, you're on a Sunday, which is which is mad. Which is mad awesome. So in today's show, we're going to talk to Sean about obviously his road to to VR and of course Dead Second. Um, and then next week we'll return to our normal show with the news uh, that you all love. But before we get into it, some quick housekeeping as normal. Uh, Let's talk Oculus is available every single Wednesday. Audio listeners can see the video version of this podcast on the Let's Talk Oculus YouTube channel. And for you video watchers, this episode is on all good podcast platforms and some rubbish ones as well. If you want to be part of the show, send in your questions at let's talk oculus at gmail.com or join our Discord where we have tons of people. I think actually right now as recording, a bunch of people in our Discord have gone into big screen and are watching a movie together on a Saturday night. Nice so that's that's really Bless lovely. the community. Come on down and join it. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, and if you really, really love us. Throw us a dollar at patreon.com forward slash playtestvr for early access episodes. All of the links to everything that I've just said will be in the description below, as well as all of Sean's stuff, of course. Um, let's get ready. Let's get into, straight into the show. Sean, let's start Let's start with you. Before we get into stuff like Dead Second, um, which is obviously the VR title you're working on, let's go all the way back. I like to always go back to the origins of Sean Edwards and, and his like VR journey. Um, when was the first time that you ever experienced VR? Uh, so I got in on the original Oculus development kit, uh, oh, Kickstarter. Nice. Um, so 2013, I think it was thereabouts, maybe yeah. somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, DK one, the original DK. development. kit. So when Palmer, uh, did his Kickstarter and got all the, uh, different industry luminaries to sort of vouch for how cool it was. Um, so I got one of those dev kits. Uh, I originally um, was working on a game of my own called Lunar Flight um, mm -hmm. back in the day. Uh, and it originally didn't have VR support. I was just making it as a hobby project. Uh, got that onto Steam. But when, when the development came along, I'd been wrapping up some work on that. And I, I pulled it out. Um, I think the first thing I tried was a, a game by Justin Morovitz. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was like a breakout. I cannot remember the name. Sorry, Justin. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was a breakout style game. And um, that was really cool. It was probably one of the, the was literally the coolest thing I, I tried at the time. Um, you basically steered like a, a the paddle if you will on a plane in front of you and um if you, you remember what the game breakout is you bounce yeah. the ball take out the bricks uh, but this was in a in a, like a corridor and you're you know bouncing the ball back and forth oh. down the hallway and it's coming back towards you very cool justin's uh mm -hmm. quite a clever talented guy and he pulled this together pretty quickly and to me it was 
very innovative the way he designed things like, I mean, this was very new back then, things yeah. like uh, contextual user interfaces. There was no hand controllers. So mm. um, he made this work without any controllers at all. You just basically use gaze-based <clears throat> gaze uh, UI selection. So you stare at an element and you'd see yeah. a little timer. Mm -hmm. And then that's how it worked. To me, that was to a lot of yeah, people. It's very, wild. very innovative, right? Like it's very mm -hmm. new today. It's it's uh, sort of we don't even do that anymore because it's <laughs> we've got better solutions. It, but... I have seen it in some games. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I think you can still use it in in some cases um, where it works. Uh, so that was my first thing. I tried a few other things around there. There was a couple of other little demos of things people had made. Some things mm -hmm. made me quite sick. But uh, actually, one of the things I tried, I think it was. It was a helicopter, a little helicopter demo that somebody had made where you could get in the cockpit and fly this little helicopter around with a with a game pad, um, take off mm. a off a aircraft carrier and then fly around and land it. And that was enough to for me to go, wow, this is this is super cool. I've got to get this mm. into my game. Um, so uh, I we'll probably get into this story, but I'm, I ventured off into developing v, VR support for Lunar Flight. Um, and back in the day, it was the number one thing to try on, on the early development kits. Uh, it was number one on Oculus Share, which was the mm -hmm. original um, platform for going and finding content for it. It was number one on there for six months. It was very wow. popular. Um, so I, I, it, it, helped, um, it helped Lunar Flight sort of find a new audience in that community. Um, I was quite active on the Oculus Reddit channel on there back in those mm -hmm. those days around, I said 2014. Um, and uh, yeah, so I kept maintaining that for a while and that sort of got me pretty into the, into the scene, the community, the industry. I started traveling over to the US, going to GDC, SVVR, mm -hmm. meeting all those guys. I've made a lot of good friends. So a lot of the old school, I would call them the OG VR developers. <laughs> yeah. A lot of them, a lot of them, we're all friends. We all know each other. We've all met. We still hang out in the, in the Discord channel and exchange mm -hmm. ideas. Um, guys like Blair Renault who makes uh, mm -hmm. Lo-Fi, Lo uh, yeah. Mark, Mark Schramm. Um, and uh, yeah, so... Um, yeah, you're an OG. You're an you're an OG. I never knew. Oh, you were, yeah. I, I never knew you were that deep into it. I because I didn't I didn't look up Lunar Flight, and I just got it up on the screen here, and I see your name, Sean Edwards, just right there. Uh, Shove soft, soft. Is that your like company that That's you made? It, yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, so following on Lunar Flight, I'd, I'd partnered up with some other people that were had some um content IPs that they developed, um, and they asked me if i'd be interested in, in helping to build a game with it and i said sure but i want to make a vr game mm -hmm. uh, so that started my um attempt at our own kickstarter to make a, a zombie vr game we call it zvr if you, mm -hmm. if you look up zvr you'll, you'll find some stuff about it mm -hmm. um again it was very early days there was still no hand track controller so a lot of it was like you know gun attached to your face and um all these things so uh, I worked on that project for about nine months. We tried to do a Kickstarter, try to get some funding for it. It ultimately didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's a shame and, because um, shame, that's this problem with Kickstarter, right? Is that I see here you had like almost 13,000 funding with three or 300 people that actually wanted that game made. But the thing with Kickstarter, right? If you don't hit that goal, then it's just, just Yeah, gone. I mean, it, 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 to some respects, it was the amount of money we were after was, you know, the funny thing with Kickstarter is, Often people are just trying to get any money they can. Mm. Um, often it's not quite enough to actually fund the whatever the development costs are. Mm -hmm. And when you add in things like um, you know, rewards, uh, you've, you've got to use some of the funding to pay for you know, to pay. To mail out shirts and all these other things mm -hmm. that you've offered to people. So some of the money goes into that. So I was a bit naive about what we were doing, but we did. I actually met with Palmer Lucky. Um, I went to the US, had a meeting with Palmer, um, oh. and talked about it i'd met palmer a few times in the early days like mm -hmm. at the first um silicon valley vr meetup it was still a small scene you know so mm. palmer was mingling with us and um but anyway uh, that didn't go anywhere that is so, so cool. it's so cool uh, and it's, it's quite surreal because obviously that was around 2013 you know around that kind of time where you you hear those stories in other mediums like like the Mac or, or like games consoles and they're all like 80s and then you hear those same conversations right but this one's yeah. just in in 2013 it's just seven years ago it's amazing yeah. how far it's come yeah you know 
yeah that short, was a really interesting uh trip when i did that that was i think i came down for two things but i also got invited to valve so i got to try out uh the original um room where they had all the fiducial markers in there yeah tiny little room with some of the the, the core team that was working on the uh, i think the, a, the uh, first development kits they talked about that in the uh oh god history of the future book yep yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. i tried that room out they um chat chet Falasek, uh invited me over i was actually up for gdc so they flew me up to seattle for the day met with them had lunch with them that was a fun day got to Chet gave me a full tour of the whole valve mm. um, building floors. That that's a very wow. interesting place. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it was exciting for me because it was like, wow, this you know this was a fun thing. I'd been working in the games industry for uh, ooh, at that point nearly 12, 13 years. I mm. worked in on console games. Yeah, um, I worked for uh, started out in a, in a studio here in Australia called Rat Bag Games, a very old PC game developer. Mm-hmm. Um, went to pandemic studios ea pandemic in the yep. australian studio worked there for a bit uh, anyway so uh, I, I for me it was like wow i'm at valve <laughs> all these years later <laughs> literally yeah. in the in their sort of entrance room where the big valve thing is uh, mm-hmm. the handle that you see in their logos um so yeah i um uh, i did a lot of things back in the day and and then um it sort of went nowhere and for a lot of people around then you know there was it was very exciting everyone was really thinking you know there was these all these and there were great opportunities but it's taking a lot longer than um everyone sort of anticipated i think mm-hmm. you know everyone sort of didn't really know where it was going to go but it was exciting you know and it's really interesting to see where we are today with something like the dk uh, sorry the the quest 2 mm-hmm. hardware and it's uh you know um all the technology that's gone in that's just amazing you know most of us could never even just the latest hand hand tracking uh, yeah. capabilities yeah. so it's still very very exciting i'm still very positive about you know some of the hardware that's on the horizon is very exciting i was about to say that obviously you saw it you used it in the very very early days did you never envision it to be this either this quick or or, or what's in there like with the hand tracking and such it was just never something that you thought about at that time um yeah it, it's weird you know when 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 everyone starts out it's like no really no one really knows there's this i think this idea in everyone's head of like being inside a virtual world right mm-hmm. and it's obvious there's all these really hard problems to solve like how do you how do you actually track your entire body and your facial expressions and eye eyes and stuff and uh without any sort of external tracking hardware right because mm-hmm. ultimately the, the the thing that's gonna make it succeed is how frictionless the the hardware is right like how sure. simple is it to pick it up and put it on and be there straight away how long does it take to get into it mm-hmm. and, and i still think that's a fairly big barrier for a lot mm-hmm. of people people don't want to sit down and fit the thing on their head and then start the software out and picking under their nose still and doing all these things that are still um there's still like if you're into it you put up with it you're fine with it okay yeah. it's, it's fine yeah. but you know my my wife would never even contemplate doing it regardless of how great yeah. the experience was you know so i think until we get there it's never gonna really hit that that mainstream market but i definitely think something like the quest 2 has really opened it up for a much mm-hmm. broader audience and now you know we are in a situation now where there is a viable market for developers you know meta yeah. has sort of really helped establish that by um heavily subsidizing and making it happen mm. uh, to prove the point that it is possible and i think you know um, that's shown many other companies that um they need to they need to start getting involved so pick what pico is about to do i think is really great for yeah. the for the launched industry. in europe now right yeah oh, um, going really, to launch in europe yeah and and i know i do know you know they've got quite a few of the main stay uh quality games out there coming they have the there. most common ones to be honest they don't have obviously yeah. everything but they have a lot of common ones and i think the main thing for them is yeah. that they're launching in germany where the quest is not sold in germany i believe yeah. uh i don't know why i don't know what the reasoning is uh, i believe that. it was something to do with um facebook uh, yeah. right it, was, it yeah it seems like meta is really just ignored or not put the europe market first to yeah. say the least yeah, yeah yeah it seems like it but you're right you're right there sean it's like one of the biggest barriers is obviously the 
ease of it's not like a playstation 5 or a switch or something where now we've got to the point now where we can literally turn it on and our game's already loaded up that's how quick it now works you know we've just we're just not there in terms of the vr and i remember that was a big issue with the playstation vr1 where there was so many different cables going about that if if you've played that one before and this it becomes a thing right you you have to take out the vr system and then you have to make sure that everything's all plugged in properly and because you don't leave it plugged in because there's so many cables so you, it's a mess so you got to make sure your move controllers are charged enough and you see who uses move controllers you know there's a lot of extra steps where you're right people like us who are kind of in the bubble fine you know you know it's like pc gaming we can toggle with the settings we kind of get a kick out of you know messing without all that stuff but the average consumer that's not what they want right so and it's not it's never going to get to that takeoff point until we have it so simple so and plus at the moment the ui for meta as well is a little bit of a mess still it just needs to be more intuitive oh yeah yes yeah that's i mean it's you you find your way around but I, look i i I have uh, stints where I'll like I got to play a bunch of new content just to mm-hmm. uh, catch up on what people are doing. And, and but a lot of the time, even just when I'm developing, because I have a, I use a Quest Two for developing, yeah. um, and uh, with the link cable, um, just so it's always got a bit of trickle charge, right? So it's, mm-hmm. it's ready to go. Mm-hmm. And um, every now and then, there are little teething issues where it just decides it doesn't want to track the room or it's lost the tracking yeah. or, you know, it works throughout the day and the lighting in my room changes and I switch, I close the curtains and I switch a lamp on and now it's like doesn't contrast is different and it's actually gotten more stable uh, recently. I think they've improved it recently. So, um, but it's still very impressive, really amazing mm-hmm. you know, what it can actually do. Uh, but yeah, finding your way around, just like um, finding the link button like yeah. it's detected yeah. it's you have to i click on i think it's on the calendar and that yeah. brings up the settings menu it's like it's not really intuitive and obvious where things are located or even your library of mm-hmm. titles like it's not front and center that's the thing if you have so many titles and say you want to play a game that you've not played for a while, for example i wanted to jump back into walking dead which i uninstalled quite a while ago but I had to go through a full list to try and find it. And when I click on install, it doesn't bring it to the top or anything like that. Like a PlayStation will bring it right in front of you. But this one will leave it in that place right at the bottom yeah. until I play it and then it will push it up, you know? Just little mm. things like that where, I mean, they are updating it quite regularly. You know, there's almost an update every month how regular these updates are now. Um, yeah. So it will get better. We can That's definitely use some folders. <laughs> folders. Yeah, I, I- I kind of wonder whether um, part of it is anti-consumer or it's d- deliberate design choices to allow them to dictate what you're seeing. Obviously, there's always when you load it up, um, they want to, you to look at stuff on the store and mm-hmm. the stuff that they're promoting, yeah, yeah. right? And that's fair enough. But there should be a thick button that just says library. Yeah. If you <laughs> click on it, it gets boom, there's all your stuff, right? Like, mm-hmm. why do I, it's, it's not that obvious. Um, yeah. yeah. So it is what it is. Um, I think, you know, competition in the market is going to um, sure. make things a lot more interesting, particularly a company like Pico, which is owned by ByteDance, which has a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, has a lot of money. That's the thing. So, they so- are like apples to apples in terms of what kind of company they are, right? They could easily yeah. subsidize this this Pico headset a lot as well to kind of compete, you know, and, yeah. and they can also give the funding for any big games and exclusives. So they can kind of do the same thing that Meta's doing on a competitive standpoint. So it's excited to see that. I, I, I'm re- really interested to see um, how they will go with opening up their store and curation of content, whether they're going to be like Meta, where it's very, very difficult to get mm-hmm. onto the store. There's a there's many, many walls in your way to get in there, not just pitching, but you know, if you're a small indie developer, you've got to have the budget to invest in something, which isn't cheap. Um, uh, even for small games, you know, it's several hundred thousand dollars. Um, mm-hmm. And then uh, you've got to be able to get to the right people and you've got to prepare a pitch and then you've got to get someone at Oculus to take your pitch. You can't pitch it yourself mm-hmm. and then you don't know what happens and then you get a response and you're like, oh shit, I, I don't know what to do now. So um, for Pico, I'm curious to see how uh, how open they make that and how mm-hmm. much... Um, stuff that you know is being rejected goes on there and maybe it becomes 
be the better place for finding stuff. Um, it might be the go-to place for indie developers, depending on how be. the store is, to be honest. Could be um, yeah. like, you know, there's a big gap there that they could. It's funny how you mentioned the whole process there where, and then your game could bomb. And then the whole thing is, you know, it was like, what, what's happening? But it's funny because two weeks ago, we had Justin from Tab Games who's making Samurai Slaughterhouse on the oh, yeah. show. And he explained how the process worked in terms of, you can get on App Lab. Obviously you have to go through all their verification stuff and make sure they're happy, et cetera. So that's a tedious process in a way. But to actually get on the Quest Store, it's up to them to kind of decide if your game's going to come on. There's no like application process or anything like that to get on the Quest Store, right? No, there used to be a place where you could submit a pitch. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't even want to. I mean, that was li literally a written pitch. So, uh, you know, they're very, they are very much, uh, you know, it's a good and a bad thing. I think I do appreciate knowing that they're curating stuff to, to, to very high standards, like say a Nintendo used to do. Yeah. Um, and that's a good thing in that, you know, it's protecting people who buy these from um, mm -hmm. just buying a bunch of rubbish mm -hmm. um, and ensuring that there's very high standards with things like, you know, all sorts of things you have to think about when you yeah. make VR content, right? It's very, yeah. there's a lot of things that you can get wrong <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're sort of um, working through that at the moment. So yeah. yeah. So long as the content does stay high quality, as soon as you start letting in, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's some questionable decisions they've made there. I think it's, partly how much demand there is for something versus how how uh i think there's other aspects to it too like if you just make another shooter and we're making we're making a shooter game what's its point of difference in the, in the yeah. market like why do we need another one of these on the store what what is it you're doing that is different right, uh, yeah. or offers value that, that we don't already have a, a lot of so um there's many th decisions i think that go into them plus if you do get approved for the official store um it's not just hey yes you're allowed to launch a game uh they they make an effort to make sure your game's Q, qa correctly mm. uh, or thoroughly so they'll allocate resources to get you onto the store that's why yes. they, they're so careful because they they are committing some of the you know some resources to that to title yeah. to get it onto the onto the store which means they can only select so many they've only got so many people that work within those teams to curate and test and um sometimes mm -hmm. i've been told it can take up to 12 weeks of qa um where they will thoroughly qa your game and you'll be that's with nice yeah. so i think that's a good thing particularly if you're yeah. a small indian and, and you haven't been able to thoroughly qa your game because um there's often many bugs you can you don't know about until yeah. someone else tries it out <laughs> yeah for sure yeah, I mean, I mean that that makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of people who pay, might be listening to this will be thinking, okay, that's all good, but how how do we have so many zombie games on the store and such in rhythm you know, games and rhythm games? Yeah, but, yeah. Again, I, I you... think I think choice is good as long as the standards are reasonably high. I don't think there's necessarily. I mean, shooters always sell. Like if you like in if you're into shooters and there's another one and it's got a little something a little bit different about mm -hmm. it, the way it's it's doing something. It, you want more like i i keep buying shooters every year i mean they're just <laughs> there's not a lot that's they're still all fundamentally at their core uh giving you a very similar experience in many ways but they work so well in vr as well they work so well yes. but we'll talk about dead second a little bit in a, in a second i was gonna make that mm -hmm. pun but no um before we move on to that though sean like so obviously you're transitioned from you've been game development for 10 12 years and you transitioned into vr how was the transition like is there a lot is there a big learning curve going from standard games to vr or is there just a few different ways of doing things well um with lunar flight one of the reasons it was pretty popular is um i solved quite a few design it, lunar flight this is my historical statement. Lunar Flight was the first commercial game um, to market at that period of the time. It was on Steam. You could buy the game. It was a complete game. It had a, um, there were no other complete games at that, at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it had achievements and missions and save mm -hmm. games and leaderboards and multiplayer and all these things that you could do. But not only that, um, I, I worked to make sure all of the 
user experience staging stuff was pretty solid as well. So, you know, what things trigger motion sickness? How do you handle mm. loading screens? All those things. No one had done those things before. So, you know, I worked out, well, they're fairly, they're not, you know, it's not rocket science, but it's like, well, um, just fade the screen out when you, or when the game starts up, you know, whether you attach something to their face or it's, it's floating, like all the little things that um, mm. give you motion cues. And then uh, it was the first game with contextual UI. So um, to solve, uh, it had a 3D cockpit. I had to model. I'm not a great model. I ended up getting a friend of mine to uh, pay him a bit of money, actually, but um, mm -hmm. to redo the cockpit for it. But the original one was pretty blocky and simple, uh, but very functional. And it was designed specifically for VR. And that was another thing. Not many games were designed. This cock, It was a happy coincidence of a lot of different things that, the lunar module was originally in, in the 2D game, um, like the actual lunar module, the Apollo mm. 11 lunar module interior. Yeah. And I changed it to this little like cockpit like structure with little displays and, uh, and uh, laid it out in a way. And I spent a lot of time on um, visual quality. So mm. working out how to render fonts without aliasing and, and how big should they be relative to the resolution of the display. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see those, are, that's one of my personal sort of passion things is to get very clean, sharp, crisp uh, quality image. Yeah. And the dead second is, I still think, one of the best in, on, on the Quest 2 in terms of image it quality. It's very, very sharp. Yeah, it's very sharp. Yeah, so uh, it's always pushing um, pushing render scale to ensure, you know, your sub pixels are there to give you that extra level of detail, anti-aliasing. But it's also, also a lot of key choices around how far away do you place elements because of the fixed focal length in the lenses on these displays. Mm. <laughs> so that cockpit had a depth of about a meter and a half to two meters. And that's roughly within the, op the sweet spot of depth perception for these headsets. That's where you get the strongest level of depth perception in 3D. So right. it sort of lent, it lent itself. It all worked uh, out. So yeah. yeah. Mm. And so then I made, um, even I had, was the first to have a curved UI display. So I would render my UI into a texture and then, and then map it onto a curved mm -hmm. mesh in front of you. And that curvature, I spent a lot of time working out how much to curve it. So mm. it was always equidistant from, from your face, depending on where you're looking. Uh, and then when you stare at elements, casting a ray cast out of the eyes, hitting yeah. a trigger, making an element pop up, that was all new. No one had sort of done those things first. So mm. then it would tell you which button to press on you. And if you look down, another thing I did, I had the, um, uh, uh, like you had a body in the cockpit uh, and the character was holding an Xbox controller. <laughs> so <laughs> if you were sitting down and holding an Xbox controller, there was this very strong yeah. one-to-one -one relationship with your pose and your, what you were doing in the game. Mm. Um, so anyway, the, you know, I learned a lot there, a lot of solving those problems or thinking about those problems and what what things were uh, would make those things work better. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, many other people have, have come into the, um, the, the development scene since then and there's been some really amazing solutions to a lot of mm. um, really cool things, um, particularly what people are doing with hand tracking um, these days, uh, that hand physics lab application Dennis yeah. Kutu, I think his name is the country um, that is really impressive stuff so yeah. yeah it's really exciting so yeah I mean aside from all of those particular issues thinking about mm. user interface design you can't do all the standard things you do in a 2d game you can't you don't have control of the screen anymore you know yeah. you've got to think about where you place dead second has a very minimalist UI and another thing I wanted them you wanted to get in talking about yeah. dead second these are these are similar sorts of things is i didn't want to have any floating ui elements attached to your head and mm -hmm. i wanted to try and make it as um you know any ui interaction was on a screen that you either held in your hands yeah or it was literally a touch screen physical mm -hmm. touch screen in the game um <clears throat> so there's no laser pointers i can't it's one of my personal <laughs> bugbears i hate about yeah. vr games it's like pointing a laser at a ui screen uh, particularly if the hands aren't filtered and it's really jittery and you're trying mm. to find it and it just to me that's um not not the best it's, it's a workable solution but um you know i think uh oh, i even thought about because you're holding guns you could shoot at the ui but yeah like um, pistol whip right yeah pistol yeah whip pistol whip is all pistol whip is really really good in terms of a lot of their design choices um mm. but you know when you have a ui screen um with a lot more, depending on what you're doing with it, you know, the, often you end up, if you have a setting screen, you have a lot of different buttons you want. You want, um, you know, the ability to interact with it in an effortless way as well. So you yeah. can 
change things quickly and point and click and drag and doing all these different mm -hmm. things. So I spent a fair bit of time on the, um, I wrote a custom uh, UI event system interaction model thing for pressing buttons down and highlighting buttons and working how deep the button should press and mm. what are some of the issues that pre if someone moves their finger really fast mm. part of the problems that you run into in vr with physics is you need really high physics sampling rate so in programming you have the, the fixed update rate which is the rate at which physics gets updated mm -hmm. if the player's velocity or the hands are moving really fast it can one frame it might be above the button and if they've gone through the screen it might be below the button and it mm -hmm. won't detect Mm -hmm. the, but if, if your sampling is faster you'll get more samples on the way down and you'll you'll hit, hit the detection so you find out well i need to make mm -hmm. the the collider deeper so mm -hmm. that there's you know, it's not perfect but you can sort of tune those things so they're more reliable um there's a lot of little things i want to go into dead second after this and try as fast as i can try and hit some <laughs> but yeah. it's amazing because you don't like as the average gamer in vr and such you don't really think about those things because obviously in flat screen gaming everything's on a controller right and you're interacting with the character but when you press x to press a button and say the character's pushing something you're controlling that yourself you already can set that yourself right but when it's vr it's all dependent on what the player does because they they yeah. have they yes. have the freedom and and, and, you know, some of the uh, spatial and ergonomic solutions you have to think about, like where you place elements, how big is the display? Mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, how clear are the fonts to read? How mm -hmm. small can you make them before they start to alias and have, you know, issues? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the dead second screens are fairly large. Um, yeah. But I wanted them to, to me, it's, it's I wanted it, to, one of the key design goals for the game was to put my wife into it and have her intuitively understand what she, she knows she uses touch devices. She knows mm -hmm. how touching buttons work. She's your play test. It, yeah, just have them. Oh, well, I've, I've tested on some people who've never played it for women and they've, they've been able to play the game just fine. Um, the only sort of, you know, one thing that will always get you is if you're asking people to press buttons and they can't see the controller in their hands. Mm -hmm. I don't, they're, mm -hmm. if they're not familiar with the controller, then that's potentially a problem. Um, there are ways you can solve that by like, showing using the capacitive sensors on the on the button so you can tell when their fingers are near them and then like mm, showing a holographic yeah. presentation of the hands and the controller and they can see where their fingers are uh, yeah. there's things you can do but yeah um okay. it's very different the designing ui uh in a way where uh you, you want some feedback um for like scores or things like that um in dead second when we display uh, your points that you're getting off the enemies or when you're shooting there's little numbers and stuff pump, pumping off them um, you've got depth issues as well you want to make sure they're rendered as in the last pass so they're not if you mm -hmm. shoot a guy and he's partially behind a wall then the text that pops up isn't half hidden by the wall so it's got to be right. rendered in the last stage so you've got to set up all the rendering staging specifically then you've got to think about you want to position in this is another very important thing with vr is whenever you do place a ui element in the scene mm. you want it to be placed on the location actually physically at that location but the mm. further away it gets you need to dynamically scale that mm -hmm. element to make right. sure it maintains a resolution image quality again you don't end up yeah. with this tiny little font that you can't read anymore <laughs> mm. so you have to write these di adaptive scaling elements and um yeah, in yeah. Lunar Flight, I did that as well. You select navigation points and it shows you like a, you know, a sort of military style HUD indicators yeah. and you look out the window and you can see the base down there. And mm. it's actually placed the circle around the base and it's massive. It's like, you know, 100 meters in size, but you're <laughs> like a kilometer away from it. So. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's, 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 yeah, that's, that's amazing. I was about to say um, shout out to the game Red Matter because they've their control system i don't know if, if you've played that sean but their control system is that on your hands you are holding literally oculus controllers you're holding the meta quest controllers and everything's interactive but they've made it in a design where it seems normal that seems correct like you're you're a spaceman and you're holding these controllers to interact with oh, different yeah. objects yeah but you yeah, can see nice all your buttons and such which is definitely a nice especially that's a game that came out early in in the meta in the quest one so yeah definitely helps people get into it but you're right i've really I, got I to check out red matter because um i've heard a lot of very positive things about uh the the art in that game the graphics yeah they've uh spent a lot of time sort of really pushing what you can do 
You'd be you'd quest. you'd appreciate it because um they made an update for the Quest Two when it came out, which pushed the graphics further, and it looks you know, probably the best looking game I've seen on Quest Two, especially something yeah. that came out on Quest One a long time ago, and just a small update, and they've they made the visuals so much better. So I'm very excited yeah. for Red Matter Two, but um yeah, yeah, I think you'd enjoy it, especially just to experience it. I think it's on sale at the moment because of all the the showcase announcements so yeah I, yeah i would recommend that 100 percent. yeah i guess that's a, that's um another interesting topic is just generally optimizing games for quest or even you know mobile headsets mm-hmm. there's um luckily uh, when i when i finished up the kickstarter for the zombie game um that's mm-hmm. how i end up when i ended up at sponge games so mm-hmm. just after that uh, I accepted a, a job at Sponge. It wasn't called Sponge back then. We were, it literally was a, a mobile game startup spun out of an animation studio. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, they got in touch with me to go and help them with their first game. Um, and so I worked on mobile phone games. I still, well, Dead Second's been in development a bit over a year now. But prior to that, that's what I've been doing for the last seven years is making mobile yeah. phone games. I noticed Sponge um, Sponge Games is mostly just mobile. This is their first VR title attached to it, right? Yeah, we we've done some internally. We've done some mm-hmm. ports of different things of some of our all of our mobile games. We played around with doing um, VR versions of them long before there was any actual. Um, well, we played around with some Gear VR stuff. Uh, Sponge Games' most successful game is a game called Fairly Breaks. Yeah, they're a very successful game for us. Um, it's done probably sixty million downloads. Mm. since it came out it was number one in its sequel which was Faley Rider <laughs> um yeah they're simple little mobile games but uh heavily ad driven for, mm-hmm. for money but fun little games um was number one on the app store worldwide for two weeks um oh, so we had a pretty pretty nice big head it still generates the majority of our revenue today yeah <laughs> uh, sure. five years it's, later it's funny y'all were uh animation studio because that's uh, also mighty coconut i think that was their origins yeah the uh, producers so of what like, about yeah there's some animation oh, yeah. into vr yeah so our parent company um liquid animation um they still they're a tier one disney studio so they do a lot of outsource mm-hmm. work for disney lego nickelodeon uh com- companies like that so mm-hmm. we've got We've got the support of those guys, and every now and then we can lean on their animators uh, for uh, some assistance or some art, art creation. But well, it makes sense yeah, why uh, Dead Second looks quite nice. Yeah. I was going to actually lead on to that the the choice of art style. So is, is that something that came from you in terms of you wanted something that's super sharp with that like cartoon graphics or we um yeah I mean there is it's it, it's tricky again optimizing for, for VR um. Mm-hmm uh the art direction we wanted to do something i i'm pretty i was pretty keen on you know flat shaded stuff i was looking for a way to uh get really fast loading mm-hmm. um and really high performance um very clean visuals i mean there's this couple because we bake our scenes our, our scene process for building our levels um not aside from our characters and, and other other elements but the, the levels themselves um it's quite a quite a process the way we build them um and it was sort of a happy accident we arrived there like we were contemplating where whether we'd put more textures and stuff in but we were sort of pushing more in that toony sort of mm. um minimalist style, style palette but trying to balance the levels levels of detail and the yeah. little accents and things and um we've got a, a nice shader that we use for our environments um which has a specular highlight in it which is which is baked in it so it really makes a lot of the surfaces pop Mm-hmm. It's a very involved process the way we build our levels. Um, there's some compromises we're giving up where you know we can't have a lot of texture detail because yeah. the whole level literally has a tiny little texture uh, of just a palette swatch of colors mm. that we use. So when you see the level unlit, it's very difficult to see because there's no depth, there's yeah. no shading on it at all. And then we rely entirely on our uh, our light maps. And because we've we're not using a lot of textures, we can use really high resolution light maps. Mm. Um, so we bake at a very high resolution. Um, it's all ray traced. So it's, it, you know, you get a lot of those lovely qualities from, from um, light maps. Um, very, uh, very high texel ratio, we're at 50 texels per, um, per meter it is. So every two and a half centimeters, we've got a, a light map pixel. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I was going to say then, you had uh, to you had to define what a texel there was because I'm, I'm pretty yeah, sure a lot of our listeners a te- would a texel, know. A texel, a texel in the light map is it's it's how many uh, pixels per meter or per unit that of, of measurement that the game world Got uses. It. So one unit in Unity is one meter. Got it. Uh, so yeah. we're at fifty. So it's yes, yeah, two two centimeters, two and a half. Yeah, I was going to say because it's a very it's a very polished game for something that's on App Lab. Like there's not many. It feels great. Yeah. I don't. I can't even think of the top of my head if there's any other game that's this polished. You know. Yeah, that's... I mean, we are a professional studio. We and a yeah. lot of my team are. Uh, at the moment, we're we're mostly we're four guys, but primarily three guys making the game. So mm. um, it's like it's part of the issue with App Lab. I got to say, it's like this game is on App Lab with the Unity Cube app. Like it's just like. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of there's there's Crazy. high tier ones like like Dead Second for example, and maybe Warplanes and something like that. And then there's so many low tier games, and it's all I War, guess that's Warplanes, what Warplanes Warplanes made it to the store. Uh, they did, maybe a yeah, month ago. yeah, a few yeah. did, yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah. Uh, the sequel went back on App Lab though. The sequel's on App Lab at the moment, and it's not yeah. made it to the Quest Store, which I'm very confused about because apparently once you're on Quest Store. Your sequel is probably going to be straight to Quest or two, but it's not. Mm, no, I think you'll still have to pass certain benchmarks for like uh, mm-hmm. depth, polish, uh, those sorts of things that they're looking for. So um, it's know. not, it's it's never, it's not a sure thing. If you're yeah. a, if you're a published developer on there, you still your next title has to go through all of the same. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it checks and balances, but I think it still it does raise your um standing within their sure. content team in terms of they know what you can deliver so mm-hmm. you know we, we've still got to prove ourselves we're, and we've we've got a big update coming out um uh hopefully middle of next month mm-hmm. um, middle of may um yeah. and it's a pretty it's a pretty pretty sizable update um we're rounding out the total number of assignments to eight uh, so there's two new ones coming um all of the weapons have been completely remodeled um to support yeah. uh manual reloading yes yeah. um uh and that was that was a very that's an that's one one of those interesting design choices again coming back to um dead seconds sort of core experience and designs was around accessibility and making mm-hmm. sure you know, almost anyone could jump into the game we didn't want people dealing with free locomotion and worrying about mm-hmm. you know i myself when i play games like half-life alex there's moments where there's this pressure points where i find it really it just becomes frustrating. Like I'm, I'm fumbling with the controls. I'm trying to reload a gun and yeah. I miss it because, you know, the interactions aren't perfect. Um, and I'm trying to move around at the same time and mm. all these different things we find up, I will deal with it eventually. And it's still a great experience, but you know, um, I didn't want people dealing with that. I wanted to just put someone in there, awesome. show them how to yeah. show them how to reload the gun, show them how to teleport around and then just, just have at it right don't worry about how much ammunition you got just and encourage that pace of play as well like yeah. part of what we wanted to do is it's an arcade game we want mm-hmm. you to try and get to that level as quickly as possible so mm-hmm. just go out have at it right like an arcade game like a yeah. you know scrolling shooter just blast everything out of the way and get to mm-hmm. the end and try and get that the best score you can um but yeah as a lot of them things a lot of design choices were always around how much time do we have the resources we have mm-hmm. how many gameplay features can we support can we keep the game balanced? You know, it's very heavily backed up by our leaderboard system. We want to make sure it's fair. So every combination, we've got over 3,000 leaderboard combinations wow. um, to ensure that whatever choice you make, whether it's the weapon you choose, uh, whether you're using manual or automatic reloading, mm-hmm. the difficulty, um, there's score um, time and accuracy scores in there as well. Yeah. Um, and one of the new things we're adding is dual wielding so you can now uh grab two guns and take them with you if you've got two guns you can also go into the gun shop and purchase a a dual version of the same gun so you can buy that gun again Mm. and when you pick the gun up you can press a button on the case and it'll equip you with the second one so you can have two of the same guns um so we've got to have all these combinations for those and that was actually quite a a, quite a challenging thing to to solve because the way a lot of our rules and systems work um, for how whether things are halted or they're in the gun cases mm. and, um, but yeah the i'm pretty excited about the i always wanted to do manual reloading but you know because i know people really want it and we had plenty of feedback telling us that wish this had manual reloading um, and i like those mechanics but it's it, it did take some development time i had to get 
our budget extended to, yeah. to improve it. But after we'd done our initial release and we saw the feedback, it's like, yeah, you know, we, we, we feel f- fairly confident we've got something of reasonably high value here. Oh. Um, so we're going to just keep keep working on it, um, keep iterating on it, and uh, you know, mm-hmm. it'll get there. And like I said, we're pretty excited. We think this next update rounds out the feature set a lot more. There's a lot more assignments. There's a lot more leaderboards. There's a lot more choices and options. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a cosmetic system coming, so you can choose different types of hands and different skins for them. Go a lot more replayability. As well. Yeah, so particularly with, um, I think a lot of people are sitting on the fence um, either mm. because there wasn't enough content there or we didn't have manual reloading. Um, there's been a lot of <laughs> polish and optimization in, in little things around the way that AI move and behave. Um, uh, I even found a bug just yesterday with um, the hit scan detection on the firing of the guns. So uh, it was one frame out. So um, it sounds like a small thing, but it actually makes the, you know, where, where you shoot, because we have, per bone collision detection. Mm-hmm. Um, our, one of our you know, unique features in the game is the, the physics system that we have for yeah. shooting enemies. So it's fully procedural. Um, and uh, you know, it, it detects, ray scans on every bone on the body. It applies forces at the location if, if you kill them. If they're not dead, we've actually got animated procedural animation where you get a reaction from the hit. Mm-hmm. Um, the expressions on the characters' faces, their design choices as well. We wanted fairly expressive faces on the characters. That was another thing we're lucky because of liquid animation. Um, there's guys there that really know how to fully rig a character's face. It's quite complicated to do all the blend mm-hmm. shapes for the face. So we can, you know, we've got 40 something controls on the face to animate it. Um, at late, if we had the time and budget, you know, we could have potentially have fully uh, animated characters with, you know, dialogue and all the rest. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that's for, you know, for a sequel for Dead Sec. And we'd like to get a, a much bigger budget and push more in the story and narrative and, explore all those things and, and do more with it but it was always it was always intended to be a small bite-sized game short mm-hmm. levels um, i think Just... a lot of games you know you go to play them depending on the type of person you are um, you have this uh sort of mental gymnastics you have to go through to the game because of the friction like what am i going to play oh i could play that game but you know it takes 15 20 minutes to play mm-hmm. through a level i forgot mm-hmm. where i was up to you got all this inventory management and all these other things right um, some people really love that, but I think it's, it's it's games like Beat Saber and Pistol Whip are far more yeah. immediate and accessible. You can pick them up, you're in and playing mm-hmm. within minutes. It reduces that friction quite friction. a bit. And so we, th- we thought we want to get you in there as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Our level loading is super fast. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. It's one of the technical achievements I'm really proud of. When the game loads up, you pick an assignment. It's like a second and a half and you're in there yeah. and off you go. Um, if you want to restart the level, second half, off you go. No waiting around. Yeah. Yeah. I do I think gonna... that's a good thing with uh, with Walkabout. The UI is just very, very simple and basic. I'm impressed that my, my brother, who's not really a video game guy, he it's basically the quest to is his Walkabout machine. Uh, and it's just very easy for him to throw that thing on and he's we're playing golf. Yeah, and I think that that's that's the way more games need to be designed. Like, it, I know there's a big push for, and a lot of core gamers are looking for deeper, longer experiences. Mm-hmm. But we need. Not saying we want a lot of you know, casual, shallow stuff. I think it's important that the execution quality is still very high, and and yeah. standards are really high. But I think there's a lot of a lot of lot to be said for much simpler um, uh, games and, and presentation to make it more approachable for mm-hmm. people that might sit on the fence and go, ah, it's too much of a video game, you know? I want to make experiences, mm-hmm. not maybe not necessarily video games, but I want to make, video, I want to make VR experiences. So our, our experience is we want you to have a shootout experience yeah. in your head when you've ever thought about what it's like to be behind and popping out and shooting. Mm-hmm. And just that's, that's the thing we focus heavily on. Bullets whizzing past your head, um, you know, yeah. all the crazy stuff that you would imagine goes out and then turn it up to 11. Yeah, for sure. It's it's you you're completely right, but I also on the the longer game aspect of it, there is fatigue in VR as well. You know, if you play for an hour or two and you take that headset off, especially for the newer players, um you do get tired. You get really tired because your brain's yeah. processing a lot, right? So yeah, a lot of that's why Pistol Whip, Beat Saber, Walkabout, Mini Golf are thriving because you know, if you've come home from work but you want to jump into a game you can just quickly put the headset and do a dead second level you may sweat a little bit because you're all over the place you know 
but you're immersed and you're good. And then once you're done, maybe 10, 15 minutes, you're out of there and you can continue, you know? So it's yeah, definitely can, good can... to have both styles. Yeah, I think um, obviously that's that's with any market. You know, there's many different um, types of people that yeah. want different things from it, right? Uh, and that's what the you know, VR needs in general. It needs to provide experiences and content that caters to a whole variety of people. Yeah, for um, sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think um, with the with the what you mentioned there in terms of maybe fleshing out the story a bit maybe dead seconds got a potential to add like a campaign, like a, like a pistol whip campaign. If you've seen that one where, you know, there's still part, it's still same kind of mechanics, but they have like a little storyline attached to it. So, yeah, we, I mean, we, we have been sort of in the background sort of concepting what the world is about and, you know, what, the where, you know, we're, mm -hmm. yeah, like there's, there is a sort of direction we're pushing. You notice like the screens of these holographic uh, touch screens and, um, there were things that we wanted to do, but it's with a very small team and a very small budget, you know, we wanted to make sure we spent our time on the things that really mattered. Uh, so we're skirting around a lot of those, those things to make sure there's enough there that um, uh, sort of makes sense to a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's one area that we, we want to spend more time on indeed. Um, but sure. you know, it's a, it's a it's a balancing act of how long can we spend developing this thing. Luckily, mm -hmm. we don't have really any very pressing financial um, uh, reasons to to stop at this stage. But at some point in time, you know, if you can't if you can't make it to the store, um, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like the, the revenue we're making on App Lab is, um, you know, it's not it's not a lot of money uh, by any stretch. Uh, so it's certainly not making any any dent at all in in what it's cost us today but you know our our vision plan is sort of long-term uh, investment plan that yeah we'll build a team up we'll build a game we're going to port it um we've, we've already we've been talking to pico so we're bringing it to, to pico mm -hmm. um yeah we develop for pc so it'll come to steam we haven't really done um any uh other hardware other than oculus for yeah. pc so we don't have steam vr support um mm. although you could probably run it quite okay on a, a steam vr yeah. headset because they can run uh things through revive is it mm -hmm. yeah. i think so yeah yeah that's um, right but yeah you know, we want we want to have native support in there or at least open xr support mm -hmm. um open vr so you windows mixed reality any 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 platform that supports that the stand, open standards it'll work on there and we'll bring it to all those playstation vr as well yeah um, it's another sure. one we would like to bring it to eventually um just to make sure we're we're soaking up <laughs> that's a balancing act to you to, to support all those platforms is is quite challenging because you've got to have them all available to test properly mm -hmm. they've all got their own platform specifics for leaderboards and achievements mm -hmm. and all those things that so someone has to you know, you've got to dedicate someone to that and if you don't uh make enough money then it's sort of you know it's yeah. a hard decision to make so we're, we're still hoping and like a lot of developers we we believe the game should be on the Oculus store. That's our main yeah. sort of obvious focus. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're working pretty hard at the moment to uh, make sure there's enough um, you know, polish and, and depth in there to sort of justify its price point and hopefully yeah. meet uh, Meta's standards. <laughs> How did you come to oh, the price point? Um, initially, yeah, we, we I did a business pitch to, to, to uh, the people that run the company. Um, that's why we started to do a VR game. Um, you know, we were looking, we we're, we're still doing mobile. We have some mobile projects still underway and we're doing stuff with Snap and a few other mobile companies, but we're finding the mobile market is brutal. It's so, yeah. so difficult. Like I said, you know, we're still it's saturated. But, well, it's, um, it's heavily controlled by ad companies now mm. uh, and uh, hyper casual games. Although there is apparently a trend to move away from that, but it's heavily driven by very small very simple made things that are designed that they're, they're ad delivery micro transactions yeah. that, that well less so microtransactions they're, they're literally um they're ad ad applications that have a tiny little uh interaction mechanic in it that's i wouldn't call them games anymore you know mm. if you look at the majority of things that were, were popular like it's anyway we didn't want to make that stuff uh, we, we did play around with hyper casual stuff for a year or two and the last couple of projects I was trying to design something that I felt had value that was still something I was 
proud of to make uh, as a as a game developer but still you got to factor in the business side of things and then you got to you know look for a publisher who has the ad capability to deliver ads and do all of the testing that they do because that's a really involved process where they'll you know they'll run a bunch of ads and i'll test a bunch of tiny little things and they don't want you to change anything because they won't be able to verify the changes and the ad numbers and they're working around tiny percentage points to get them the metrics right and um, it's not it's just not something we really want to to get too involved in so anyway, i made the case um that uh, price point back to that um uh if we had if the market was a certain size um based on quest one performance we were doing i was doing some rough estimates of how many quest one units were out there um if you made a game in the genre that we were doing and you tapped a, a certain percentage of them at a certain mm-hmm. price point this is how much revenue you would generate um and that was that was a pretty compelling thing for uh, for my partners so um they got the board to approve us to go off and and chase this thing um and thankfully it, it turned out like it did doubled our expectations in terms of we we're predicting um uh where we're at now where there's an estimate of 10 million quest twos out there we, we were predicting maybe 4 million. Oh wow <laughs> um, so you know if we can get the market share we think we should be able to get given the, the type of genre of game we're at um and then looking at the price point we're, we wanted to make sure I'm, I'm very strong on value i think you know if you're going to ask people to pay for something you have to think about a price point that is is fair you know it's mm-hmm. it's not just um because i think people do go make a valid judgment and if you you can i'm a, i'm very much about earning good favor favor from people who buy your games um because you just remove one of those aspects of them thinking of you as this company that just wants to make money and you, you know mm. there's this you know complete detachment between the developers and the people who play the games but for me I, with my experience with my own game i know if you actively engage with those people you can build a you know, strong evangelist for what you do um and so we we just originally were like oh we we didn't we knew we didn't have enough content like we, we don't have a hell of a lot of levels but the levels take a lot of time to make one level in our game takes about two months to build um, wow. and when there's only the three of us and it's and i'm doing um, I do most of the finaling work. There's the two other guys that work with us. Our artist who does all of the modeling, um, he also helps design levels. He, in fact, designed several of the levels um, and built them assets for them while he built them. And then I come and final them and do all the testing mm. and do a lot of gameplay refinements and lighting and audio and everything else that needs to be done. Um, so we had four levels at launch and we're like, what, what should the price point be? And I think it was... Uh, I think it was ten dollars, and we felt, given the quality and execution of the experience and how fun it was, we felt that was a fair price point for you know, where it was at that time. And then Still, we noticed people were people were like, you know, this is really cheap for what we're getting. I was like, all right, we'll bump it up two dollars to twelve dollars. <laughs> I see. I like it. Yeah. No one, no one cared, right? So, um, and then uh, we're looking at this next update coming out. We're going to raise the price again. So we we figured every time we in- increase the amount of content then it's okay for us to uh, adjust mm-hmm. the price to make sure that you know uh, we need it to be at a certain point to make sure that we're, we're going to generate um, some revenue that mm-hmm. that allows us to uh to justify and P- pistol whip did the same thing as mm-hmm. they added more content i think that's a perfectly legitimate way to go I about so it too. i think it's a better way to do it than to do dlc packs. yeah or the inverse we'll do, do it, dlc yeah. where you've got yeah. you know um yeah, you, then you have to sort of work out should I price it? Um, what? How much do you price your DLC mm-hmm. then? And uh, some people don't really like they they see that as a negative sort of strategy where you know a lot of gamers particularly go well, you know you didn't include that in the price because you just wanted more stuff to sell and you should have just included later it in right the yeah price and there's all those sort of concerns like we're, we're not absolutely opposed to things like if we continue to add content to the game and we don't want to raise the base price um uh to because there's a barrier of entry there as well right we wanted to make it eventually so that, yeah yeah you you have these impulse buy price points where um mm-hmm. there's a lot of research around it like if you're at 15 dollars, you may as well be 20 dollars for some people a lot of people that that five dollar difference isn't really mm-hmm. a, a critical factor um 
but there's also a quality expectation at certain price points too. So if you're too cheap, mm -hmm. then you can come off as, oh, that's probably bu budget shit. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's probably not very good. And there's a psychological perception there that you have to think about as well. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're hopefully relying on, um, you know, the word of mouth to get around. Uh, yeah. We really need um, a lot more um, of the, the bigger YouTubers to cover the game for us. Um, yeah. we, we, we clearly see that when, um, with the initial release, we had uh, um, Bido Benjo, Game of Nexus, uh, and um, BMF mm -hmm. yeah. um, cover the game. And all of those guys, um, you know, they, they got reasonable views and we saw reasonable spikes in revenue. Mm -hmm. If we could maintain those, just those, they, that would um, fund our team. Uh, so, but we, you know, with some of the larger ones, we didn't really get much cover. We're not sure if they didn't want to cover the game because the game's not finished yet. There's not enough mm -hmm. content there for them to cover the video. So we're hoping <clears throat> this next up update, which really fills the game out, um, might encourage. I feel, them I feel to like that. I feel like Gamer Tag VR would cover it if you. If you Gamer, said... Sorry, Gamer Tag has has played. Yes, he, 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 has, yeah. he played it when it came out. But he does. Was... He does everything. <laughs> everything that's Everything's good. Shooter. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so we I know they um Beardo and, and uh, BMF are gonna come back and check out the new update. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple of other guys. So but yeah, at, at the end of the day, we 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 try to market the game. We've got it on SideQuest, we've done ad spends on, on SideQuest to get the banner spots yeah. to make sure people can see the game. Because you're when here it's, when it's visible, yeah. <laughs> when the game is visible, you know, I think people buy it and I'm hoping um as you know word gets around, uh more and more people will check it out. Sure. I mean, the obviously the the one of the biggest issues is that it's just on App Lab and it's not on the store because App Lab is so cumbersome to kind of try and find a game on there. You know, let alone I think the average consumer yeah. probably doesn't know App Lab exists. And if they search for Dead Second, it won't come up unless you press the button at the bottom saying it could be on App Lab. It adds know? that friction. Yeah. 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 So at the moment, it's invisible. You know, we we're we're well aware of that fact. Mm -hmm. Uh. So we have to we have to have a marketing strategy and we've got some budget to spend on ads and, and other things um we're gonna in, you know put a bit more time coming up for our once we're out of early access uh you know, our marketing materials our trailers all those sorts of things mm -hmm. we're gonna up the production standards on those sorts of things um so yeah you know it's um i'll be yeah bit. i'll be surprised if it's not on the store at some point to be honest because i remember seeing um smash drums um and i remember covering that and that was on app lab and that was fantastic but it was until they had a lot of content in there and then obviously they had the following behind it is when quest yeah, meta kind of got, took notice and now this on onto the store so yeah, it seems yeah. to be like the one where as soon as you get to a certain amount of content and at the same level as you're currently creating them, you know, it's only the matter of time, you would hope. Anyway. It's, it's yeah, it's that and the metric. So they will look at your, uh, the good thing about the Meta's platform, um, they've got really, really great metrics uh, mm -hmm. and analytics tools built into it. So we can go on and we can see all sorts of information about, you know, um, how long people are playing the game, what the average frame rates are, battery consumptions, uh, retention and, and engagement, all the reviews and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, they'll be looking at, you know, once you reach a certain download milestone um, and a retention and engagement mm -hmm. milestone. I think once you hit those numbers, it's like, well, we know that was on the store. Um, uh, you know, it would yeah. cater it to would a, a good well. portion of the market. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's a sensible way to do it. And that's, that's kind of way the when I said companies used to work for the mobile games. They sort of look at the numbers, the retention and engagement mm -hmm. numbers, when how long, when thing. people buy it, how long do they play it for? How long do they churn out for when they stop playing the game? How active is the community? Uh, all those sorts of things. Yeah. This yeah. is one thing Meta has. It's the data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they do. Um, Sean, what, what are, obviously is it out on PC or is it something that you're, putting towards pc at the moment that's it is on it is on the oculus store on pc on oculus. is it is there many differences between the two or are they pretty much the same the, game? well uh yeah there's one key difference with the pc version um yeah. i developed the pc version has a, uh, a special promotional camera system that i developed for it okay. so um when you look on your monitor the mirror mm -hmm. view is displaying a special camera that isn't the same as the player view. It's it actually has two modes. You can you can oh. toggle it. The default is this action camera mode, 
Yeah. Um, and the action camera does it, has a lot of smarts built into it where um, it can detect when you're pointing the game and aiming at an enemy mm-hmm. and it will zoom in and focus on that target and it adapts right, this yeah. field of view for that camera. So it's designed mm-hmm. for people to spectate. Um, mm-hmm. It has overlays for the score and, and other things. So if someone's watching you play, they get this far more dynamic, cool looking yeah. view. If this someone has gets blown be in the up or they die, the, uh, yeah, well, the, the camera will um, even track targets. So if they get blown up, it'll like track them, like getting blown through the air for, for oh, a few yeah. seconds, right? And it's got all these things to detect when you're like not looking at the target anymore. Um, yeah. And it makes it really, really much more entertaining to watch. Uh, and the intention was specifically two things. The, the original mode was just, I needed a stabilized camera for capturing footage for the game. Mm-hmm. So it's similar to what other games do. And on PC, because the game is very simply simple to render, um, it's very high performance. The game, most PCs can render the game world more than once, right? So mm-hmm. the player's seeing the view, but this other camera's rendering the entire view again uh, with a different field of view um, of all this, this cool stuff going on. Um, so you can find some footage of that in my Twitter. I, I post some of the... It'll be uh, also the... Right. The viewers on the YouTube would have seen it as well because I would have overlaid it. But um, I saw it on Twitter, actually. I saw that Zoom feature on there um, that you were working on, but I assumed it was just a feature that you were bringing, uh, you know, at that in that mid-May feature, but I didn't know it was already out on the PC. As no, well, that, was, that was in the launch version. Uh, yeah. um, uh, Mike VR, is it Mike VR? Oh, VR Oasis um, guy. Uh, VR Oasis, yeah. yeah. So he did tweet about it. He was talking, and, and a few a few of the YouTubers um, picked up on it and found out about it. And it was like they like it when developers make features that make it easy for them to make interesting sure. content. And that that was the intention for it. And it's sort of like I said, it was initially I designed this really smooth, nice capture mode for capturing footage for the for the trailers instead of just raw, jittery, you know, um, feeds that you mm-hmm. get from the mirror view. Uh, and then I started thinking, oh, it'd be cool, you know, if you shot a guy, the camera zoomed in on him and yeah, like um, more and you could have that movie. as a mode. So yeah. that is on the PC, if you play it, um, that's the default mode. We wanted to do um, cross-buy, but you can't enable cross-buy unless you're on the store. Right. So uh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah that makes but sense. For anyone, yeah. Who's, anyone who's bought the game, whether they buy it on PC or buy it on Quest, if they email us with their receipt, we'll give send them a key for the other version. Oh, nice, nice. That's that's a nice touch. Um, yeah, that that feature is is really cool. It's like a cinematic mode in a way. Um, I don't know if any of you two have played Red Dead Redemption Two, but on there, once you're like riding the horse, you can enable cinematic mode, so it be- it looks like you're watching a Western movie as you're riding your yeah. horse to the. And it's, yeah, it's it, it gives you... me those type of vibes. Yeah, yeah, it's great when you enable that uh, auto auto pathfinding for the horse it rides itself to the yeah. destination yeah and you, you can, can just turn sit back and just watch <laughs> yeah just it's, whole actually, day. <laughs> it's really really beautiful um sean i was gonna ask you actually kind of going back a little bit um obviously sponge games is mostly mobile apps and this is the first vr one why why the change into vr was that something that you just really wanted to do and market it uh, to the company or yeah i'm i'm pretty much the one spearheading the push to move either, either to, uh you know for help us to, to pivot out of mobile games um mm-hmm. i mean we're still very much deeply involved in developing mobile games and for yeah. the foreseeable future we most likely will and we saw this as um you know an opportunity on on the on the horizon with my background and experience um i'm pretty well suited to put a team together to build a vr game so it was something i really wanted to do i was you know i was mm-hmm. talking to my partners about how how uh how uninspired i was about to make another mobile phone game <laughs> <laughs> and i really wanted to do this so um they were like yeah okay you know you've cranked <laughs> out 13 games for us here <laughs> you can go and do this thing now so blair um, wasn't able to, no, they're, they're right you behind it. to go Sorry? work on lo-fi blair was able to get you over there blair uh i've offered here to help him out every now and then but blair doesn't have the budget to hire me (laughs) (laughs) that's fair yeah Um, that's no i i still chat with blair quite quite frequently yeah um yeah he's uh he's another og and he's um very passionate and diligent about his project he's been working on for a long time yeah Yeah, i recently just it'd been about a year since i hopped in lo-fi and uh i hopped in last week and i tweeted at him because just the intro sequence was just so beautiful. Yeah, uh, Blair is really good at again for me. What one of the things I like about VR is 
creating it gives you experiences that you can't have any other way mm-hmm. Blair's games are, are very strong in that slant of creating creating this experience and really making it really rich and deep yeah it just it felt it felt so great and then he in his reply though he was like sorry i'm taking so long <laughs> we should try to get him on the show that'd be an interesting chat to see how lofi is doing I'm, I'm, I'm hoping i'm hoping his game lines up with the sort of you know the the high-end vr stuff sort of merging back mm. into the mainstream because it's sort of you know, everyone's focused mostly on, on mobile vr at this stage and that's certainly where a lot of developers are turning their attention uh, but i think with with playstation vr coming out the mm-hmm. The, the opportunities there to find a market for uh, those higher end experiences because he you know he needs needs a higher end PC or, or PlayStation yeah, it does. to to, to achieve those but it's uh, it's so good when you when you do you get to experience those high end uh, experiences. I can't wait his till, game till Lofi it. is uh, 2D as well, a flat screen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think Blair's doing that to ensure, you know, there's an opportunity to, for other people to experience the game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it opens up more markets for him. So it's a, it's a pretty good idea, I think, to make that happen. For sure. I think he got a lot of free marketing when Cyberpunk was about to be released. And I, I saw a few news outlets, like some big ones that said, look at this, it's basically Cyberpunk in VR. And they were showing lo-fi, like obviously the earlier stages when Cyberpunk yeah. came out. So... Yeah, no, I think if he if he manages to kind of get in the bed with Sony a little bit, um, that would be fantastic for him because I think there'll be a lot of consumers and a lot of like average gamers on that PlayStation 5 ecosystem with the PSVR 2 that if he can get something on there, that would be that would be fantastic for him. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, What was the inspiration of this game then? Like, obviously, you know, you, as you said, you got a shooter that's that's been done before but obviously you you put your own take on it with the arcade shooter there's not many of those out there what was the inspiration of this one um so the last mobile game i made was a game called sharpshooter right um and um it has the 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 physics-based hit interaction system that we have was actually Mm -hmm. developed in that game um and the way the time scaling effects sort of work so we sort of um develop that there and then uh coming off that when we decided hey what we're going to do the original idea was i will um you know we had a prototype a demo running of that game in vr you could play that game very very short levels the levels Mm -hmm. are like each level is like you shoot maybe five guys from a stationary position um different character style um different environment art style but it was immediately fun and and you could give it to people and they would play through we had like 50 levels and they'd play for all 50 levels before put, put, giving you the headset back because wow. it was just so compelling and immediate. Yeah. Uh, it's got that little, that, that just the right amount of, um, you know, engagement where um, just one more, just one yeah, more. I was just going to say, more, oh, right? just one more. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and so we, we knew if we could capture that um, and, you know, uh, in a game that was designed specifically for it um, with, and, you know, up, up the quality of the art and other, other, other aspects of it, that was it was no sort of um high uh high vision sort of thing really it was more practical strategic thinking around mm-hmm. what's something we've got that we know is fun and immediate or you know what works in the marketplace from a vr standpoint what's shooters are obviously you hold guns in your hands yeah. um there wasn't a, a great deal of deep you know uh, research and development and thinking about innovative you know ideas um i just wanted to make sure everything that is in there is, is done to a pretty high standard like mm-hmm. uh, things like even going through all of the manual reloading stuff lately um that was very challenging to make sure it works consistently and it, it, you know a lot of games you can tell they avoid dealing with a lot of those um, problems because they're hard problems to solve just things like uh just racking the slide on a gun any two-handed yeah. interaction i'm not using any third-party um, library for all of my hand physics mm-hmm. it's all custom rolled stuff i've developed um so you yeah, i've got tools for doing hand poses all the hand poses are contextual. I don't have any hand tracking. So right. if you move your hand near a, near a screen, it, 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 it goes um, into a pointing pose. Mm. So you don't, and again, it's so, I don't need to teach people. I need to, you don't need to tell somebody. It just works for them. They move their hand yeah. near something that they think they can touch and the hand goes into that pointing pose. Mm, if you natural. move your hand near one of the guns, it opens into an open pose. 
and then grabs the gun. If you move your hand near the other gun, it cups the gun. Mm. Um, if you grab a magazine, it's got a pose for holding the mag. The mags are over the shoulder. Yeah. And then if you put the magazine in, it can transition into the cupping pose because mm -hmm. it's already sort of there and it's all smooth. It doesn't snap. Um, what else? Yeah. Uh, the game kind of the game it. understands exactly what the player's intentions are, right? Which makes it a little bit yeah, easier. Yeah, and then making sure it works. You know, some games, uh, particularly thing like like um, racking the slide, uh, mm -hmm. you can either have a button. We've got a button press, like in Half Life Alex. If you go yeah. to grab it, you've got to worry about the collider, uh, the, the controllers colliding mm -hmm. together. Even with cupping guns, you know, some people I've watched people play it online, and some people like do this when they're mm -hmm. cupping to stabilize the hand instead of resting the controllers this way yeah. if they do that it doesn't work the game actually has uh, recoil stabilization if you do do this it reduces the amount of recoil on the gun nice. so for the automatics you really want to, to stabilize them mm -hmm. um, things like um, you know a lot of little things I like to play around with and develop the magazines if you drop them on the ground they've got physics based dynamic sound uh, mm. production so when it hits the ground it checks how much force there was that controls the pitch and velocity um, so it sounds really realistic when you toss the magazine onto the ground. Um, even every shell can make a that comes out. Every shell casing that hits the ground can go ting 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 all around with 3D yeah. spatial audio. There's um, a lot of level so of detail when it comes to these this game, right? I, I see how much you've put into it because there's a game on the Quest or uh, the Zombie Land VR which has very similar elements to what Dead Seconds trying to do. And when I first mm -hmm. played Dead Second, I was like, oh, it's basically Zombieland. But I like I jumped into it yesterday, Dead Second, and jumped into Zombieland just to see what they're like. And the thing is with Dead Second, you do have those extra little bits where, yeah, it's so satisfying if you shoot someone or pull off a headshot or something. Could you get that nice feedback? And it, something about it just feels a little bit better than something like Zombieland where... It's, it is that arcade style, but it doesn't have those extra level details, which you really appreciate it for the immersion side of things, right? I think that wh why I wanted to make every, everything physics-based, particularly the hit reactions on the enemies, mm -hmm. is one of the things I don't like in a lot of shooters is canned anim hit reaction animations because you start noticing them, right? You shoot the mm -hmm. guy and he, they always do the same thing, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you don't get any real dynamics from it. I think part of what makes VR very powerful is the, the visceral nature of things you're experiencing. Mm. And the stronger you can make those physical connections, the more believable or more impact it has. Yeah. So if you shoot a guy in the shoulder or um, in the leg, it should hit and react in that location. Mm. Um, if, and, the, and the direction the shot came from as well, if you shot from this way, yeah. the forces should go that way. Back it's all physics-based. <laughs> Yeah, um, it is all it is all all physics based, um, and then it's like tuning the ragdolls because um, I've done a lot of the games we made at Sponge are um, ragdoll physics based games, mm -hmm. and I've had a lot of time learning how to tune character constraints for physics for ragdolls and working with okay. those things. So the ragdolls in in Dead Second are tuned very very well to make sure they don't do anything weird in terms of where they're. A lot of ragdoll mm -hmm. games you see them and the developers just instantly uh, turn the character to a ragdoll and they just clump into a weird mm. flop, right? Real that people, when they go down... Samurai Slaughterhouse. Yeah, <laughs> when does. people die, I've never seen this happen, but, um, you know, your muscles don't immediately stop. They, they lose contraction, right? So you sort of relax into it, mm. right? Um, or, you know, there'd be still some torque or forces in, in their limbs or joints. Yeah. So one of the things I do, if you shoot a guy uh, in the left portion of their, their torso... Um, I add additional torque rotations through their spine. So when they go down, I'll continue to roll in that direction. They don't just drop mm -hmm. with the force. They'll actually start rolling a little bit and you'll get these more dramatic reactions from yeah. it. Plus with the, uh, the time scaling, does, uh, it doesn't activate until just after the impact. So you get that initial punch and then it goes into slow-mo. So you get these really dramatic hits and then mm -hmm. it goes into slow-mo for that little bit. And that that's just makes it feel more impactful. So there's a lot of little little nuances and touches in it to really make that feel really nice. Haptics on the weapons, um, the sound effects from the guns, they're very mm. meaty and chunky. We didn't, we wanted to make them real, but we weren't sort of going out and trying to get perfect recordings of the real thing. We just said, oh, you know, this giant revolver, it should just sound like a massive cannon. Boom, right? They should mm. just have this really meaty sound to it. And that's sort of the way we sort of make those, those sort of audio design choices. There's dynamic audio as well for music. Um, when you enter into a fight, if someone spots you, there's a we've got this thing called a, a stem track system for music. So there's like a bass 
music track that's like your, mm-hmm. your bass beat and all the tracks are playing and they're all uh, designed to go together but when certain things happen we, we we raise the volume on one of the other tracks so the beat gets up more intense and then when it gets really wow. into the fight we bring up the next one and then when it ends it's, you know it just sort of drops back down to the lowest one that's so there's yeah. a lot of things you don't realize are happening that they're oh. playing on your subconscious that really creates that that experience well, that's, that's the that thing that's why some of these vr games that are that are really good it's the it's because of all that effort that you've put into it and all those little tiny parts people don't notice it because it it just works how it should be working and that's kind of you know obviously people should kind of notice it but at the same time if you notice it then it's probably not natural and probably not real so it's those little simple things that just make that vr yeah like dead second i wouldn't have never guessed that all of these little things are happening especially with the character but that's what makes it special because it's happening exactly how i expect it to happen not like a technical video game that would do the same animation every time you do an uppercut or something you know yeah, well, they've got a limited selection of animations they can pick mm-hmm. from just to add some variation. So, I mean, you yeah. just see some very similar things because its characters are facing towards you and you hit them in the head. They always snap their head back, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, it is, um, I really enjoy it. Like, I think one of the important things when you make a game is, um, I've worked on plenty of games that I just didn't really care about, but mm-hmm. it was, it's my job. Um, but occasionally you work on a game where, every time you play it you enjoy it like it's just yeah. satisfying to play and i get this even now i was working on on one of the the, the, the latest levels playing mm-hmm. through it and it's just always immediately something i think it's because it's such a physical real thing you could potentially do like go go and play paintball or gel ball or something like that on a field if you mm-hmm. enjoy that sort of the concept of that experience it can always give you that experience because it's, sure. it's you're, you're really doing it you know um that's mm-hmm. i think the thing that little nugget of the experience of being in a shootout that I wanted to try and capture it's a cover shooter where you're hiding behind cover and popping out and you yeah. zip over there they're looking and thinking you're over there and you step out and take them all out and you feel like a badass mm-hmm. <laughs> all those things yeah for sure for sure this honestly um Sean this game is fantastic it's really fun I have a lot of time with it and um Actually, the, the when this when this video comes out, um, I also have a video on my YouTube channel playing it, um, and I also have these uh, like gun attachments for the Quest oh, headset, yeah. which just make it even better. <laughs> I want to get a little them, bit the, more weight. Are they just uh, the static ones? You can get the ones that have the little haptic. Pulse yeah. Oh uh, boy, I saw tube. Tech Man do with one of those. Oh man. Yeah, I've not got. I got the static ones, but they're they're little, they're the pro tube ones are much more expensive, but they look cool. Yeah, because they have yep. the feedback and the recoil. I think they're a French company that do them. Yeah, B haptics was another thing we were thinking about adding support for. Um, mm. However, um, we don't. Uh, the player is only the, the head; they don't have a body. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we do, we do uh, a lot of things with the way the AI system works when they're shooting at you there's to make it balance so it's very easy to make ai perfect right they hit you mm-hmm. every time they do fire a projectile like it actually has to travel through through the air so you can sidestep bullets yeah. particularly if you take a guy out somebody else has fired at you and you can just see that round coming mm-hmm. in you can step around them and it creates those opportunities um but uh you have this sort of sphere around your head that they'll shoot all around the edges of it until they're allowed to shoot you and there's a bunch mm. of rules when they're allowed to shoot you, what difficulty you've chosen, how long it's been since you get got hit last time, right. um, yeah. whether you know whether they've how long they've noticed you for. If they've only just seen you, there's a period of time before they're allowed to actually hit you. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of those things get tighter on the harder difficulties. Yeah. So there's more chance you get hit, um, and there's still a chance you could step into a bullet, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I was going to say, so thing. stay really still. <laughs> <laughs> yes until you can probably count their shots it is a, got a bit of variation in it but there's you can probably tell when the next shot's probably going to hit you if you if you pay enough attention um <laughs> the players guns are interesting uh because of the time scaling effects um i couldn't have um it it, it does both hit scan i don't know if you know much about shooters and the way um hit or projectiles work so you can have a game where you fire a projectile and it actually has a you know a 3d object traveling through space or you can cast a ray on the shot and immediately hit the thing in that frame those games like old school uh, shooters like doom and quake and things like they all use hit scan unreal uh, because it's immediately you get immediate feedback from the click 
boom, yeah. boom. As soon as you press the button, it's, it's immediate feedback. Feels yeah. really good. In dead second, uh, when you're pointing the gun, if it if it detects that you're over part of the limb of a character, it's a hit scan. Hits them immediately. If it doesn't detect anything, it fires up a projectile, and that's when you can do re re recoil shots. The yes. projectile's yeah. obviously a lot slower um, for that, uh, but it's um it's tricky because when you shoot projectiles, you want a tracer to fly off it. Mm -hmm. But the hit scan ones, I've got a special thing to make sure that it creates a fake trail from yeah. the point of impact back towards you by a certain length. I you get see. those blood impacts. The little blood droplets are physics as well, and if you've no never noticed that, the blood that no. flies off the little spheres, and if they, if they land on things, they actually have collision. They'll fall and collide on surfaces. I'm gonna have, a, yeah, I'm gonna have to look at that next time I play. Yeah, so if you get if you get the Phoenix, which is like the last most yeah. expensive gun, it fires 20 rounds a second. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. It just it's like a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> it's empty, and then you got to reload it. Uh, but when you sh when you shoot guys with that, um, it's just like just the spray it comes off them. That's when I've you can really that. see it happen. I've seen that yeah. on your Twitter, you using that gun. And I was like, I haven't got that gun yet. <laughs> I'm not, yeah. obviously not far enough, but yeah, that yeah. definitely looks fun. I'm really yeah. curious to see how people go with the, the choices for manual reloading. Cause mm. if you choose dual wielding for, um, for manual reload, you choose manual reloading as a choice in the options. But uh, if you have two guns, you have to put one away to load the other one. <laughs> yeah, and it tough. actually it actually it actually impacts the pace and flow of the game, I think, negatively. Mm. Um, I think a lot of people are gonna use manual reload will just take one gun. But yeah. if you want dual reload, just use your automatic system, right? It's just yeah. like mm -hmm. just yeah. go for it. That's um, fun, yeah. That's that's super yeah. fun. I can see both I can see both because I I love manual reloading in a lot of shooting games. Um because it just it just once again it adds to that immersion. But at the same time, like you mentioned earlier, the automatic reloading is good for everyone who just wants success. I love Plus. easy reload. I love not thinking. <laughs> in fact, I love rec room paintball because there's no reloading. <laughs> so you're catered to people I like do, Samson. I too <laughs> like rec room paintball. I play a lot of rec room paintball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um what i well let's let's round out the show because it seems like the sun in vancouver is disappearing i'm getting darker on the video feed here um but essentially that was dead seconds so dead seconds action arcade shooter i guess you would you would call it right yeah action arcade cover shooter cover yeah cover shooter um very like house of dead style in a way yeah, I mean, there's a lot of everyone that plays it says it's time crisis in VR, right? Yeah, that's yeah. that's the angle a lot of people run with. So we don't we try not to mention that, but for legal reasons, we don't want to say yeah, sure. draw, <laughs> draw any attention. But it is very much that experience, you know, yeah. um, particularly the auto reload. You know, you're standing there shooting the bad guys until you can move forward. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, fantastic game. Uh, all the links for that game will be in the description as well. Um, Sean, let's round up the show with um, three more questions, but more like fun, quicker questions. First one I want to ask you is, what is your favorite VR title or one of your favorites? Ooh, one of my favorites. Um, uh, there's a game called... I can't think of the name of it now but it's um it's one of those games where you're on a spaceship and you're moving across the map mm. sins of a solar empire is that it no that's a strategy game oh, it <laughs> uh, is it, yeah that's a real-time strategy video game it's a pc only game no it's a pc only game um oh god what's it it's called? a space it's a spaceship game though it's you you're, like you're, you're on a spaceship right I can't think of the name, but you're on a spaceship. I played a lot with my son. You're on a spaceship. It's one of those games I think came out before its time. They should really pick it up again. It's one of one of the bigger developers that make games. They're a fairly large studio, but I don't uh -huh. think they they got a lot of traction with it when it first came out. They really should pick it up again. Anyway, mm -hmm. it's a co-op game where you're on a spaceship. Um, one person is a commander. Another person can, there's like a bridge sort of thing. Um, yeah. And then you're flying through space. You stop. Um, you have an interaction with another ship. And then they might come on board your ship or you need to teleport onto their ship, take them all out and then capture their ship and then take all their stuff and then get back. And then wow. I'm trying to think of the name of the mobile game that FTW, Faster yeah. Than Light, FTL. You ever seen the game FTL? No, no I haven't. No. Um, it's a little indie game that came out a while ago. You're trying to traverse across uh, space and light. being chased. It's very similar to that. There's a few games that are like that, uh, but in VR. Uh, I wish I could remember what it was called. 
Interesting. Yeah, I'm trying to find like a I've got Google open. I'm trying to find other games that you kind of described, but I'm I'm seeing Fail Space, Space Team VR, From Other Suns. I don't know if any From of those. Other Suns, that's it. From Is Other that Suns. The one? <laughs> nice. Yeah. From Other Suns. Wow, yeah, it came yeah. out 2016. Yeah, it's 2016's uh, Game Informer's VR game of the year. Yeah. um so wow that, that's Matt, one that's nice. really memorable I mean, there's a lot of great vr experience but that one in particular i had a lot of fun particularly playing with my son it creates these really chaotic uh, moments and it's cool because there's always something to do and it feels very much like um it's a right right amount of scope and scale for mm-hmm. uh, what was the, <clears throat> when was the last time you played this game oh years ago okay years ago yeah, it'd be, I think I've I, actually got a YouTube. I've got a YouTube video on my YouTube channel of me see. playing it. Um, well, I was looking at. it, I was like, oh, I'm like interested to maybe buy it and try it. But when I see internet connection required on an old game, I'm a bit hesitant. Um, uh, you, you, it's a game you really. And I think that's one of the reasons it didn't really take off. Um, is because it, it. I think it's co-op only. I'm not sure you can play it single player. No, yeah. I could. Uh, I got one per- like do you just need one other person do I just yeah. need to convince one person to do it okay oh yeah if you can get one other person to play it with you um I, I really enjoyed it uh, it was a quite quite a fun game VR game of the year there's there's something to do with that um I like it. <laughs> that's a deep dive Sean I've I've seen I've seen recently you tweeted that you got yourself a PS5 and you're playing Ghost of Tsushima um how has that been just on a no, non-VR question um I'm, I'm a i'm a really big game so i play a lot of games um uh i'm loving ghost of tsushima there's so many reasons i love it it's yeah. not just a great game with really really tight mechanics i think the combat in it's really 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 well designed mm-hmm. um but it's so, so beautiful, beautiful to look at. yeah it's like every every cut scene someone spent a lot of time on the lighting and composition of every mm. shot it's always mm. a, just so cool to look at um mm. it's very very uh it's a masterpiece <laughs> yeah it's work, it's really. such a such a beautiful game and plus you can play in different art modes as well can't you in terms yeah, of you can yeah, play in black and white mode. Yeah. yeah i started the game in black and white mode and i was like okay I, you can't really experience the beauty as much but it's still cool to play it in that black and white movie like yeah. mode um yeah that game is is phenomenal i see you you're a big fan of uh, gran turismo as well i think you like the games with good visuals is what i'm seeing um i think that just that's just i'm i've always been into racing simulations i'm a big sim guy as well so Mm. my other the main thing i usually go to thing for vr games is sims so racing games flight simulators um that's a big big draw for me for obvious reasons they're perfectly suited Mm -hmm. um for vr uh i'm really hoping really hoping gran turismo 7 i think it's a foregone conclusion that gt7 will get psvr2 support once yeah. it comes along um that could be really good because the psvr2 has f- as far as i know the first headset that uh, makes good use of fixed oh, not sorry not fixed foveated, foveated, foveated rendering, yeah. rendering because yeah. it has eye tracking so they can really optimize it down so it's going to be really great mm. to see how well that performs on that headset i'm really excited about psvr2 i think that's going to be a really a really great piece of hardware and a driving game really doesn't matter if you have the cord yeah and I'm, i love it so much i'm gonna um well, yeah, it's true. You can play. I, I'm at the moment playing with the gamepad. I'm probably halfway through everything that's in it. Um, uh, but I am looking Get at wheel. buying. Yeah, well, I already own a Fanatec wheel that I bought years ago um, for the Xbox 360, I think. It came mm. out for one of the Forza games. Um, and it still works as fine. I can plug it into the PC. But there's a new Fanatec direct drive wheel that was just, that's branded with the Gran Turismo um, nice. setup, and it's got a special wheel design for accessing all the things like traction control and brake yeah. bias and stuff. Uh, yeah. It's very expensive. It's like uh, the bundle with the pedals and the stand's going to cost about two thousand yeah. Australian. They're not cheap. Dollars. They're not. They're not no, cheap. No, but, but they're really, really good. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty. I've got to justify, but um, I'm doing renovations on my house at the moment. I'm not sure I can justify the extra cost. <laughs> my wife will not be happy. If that Maybe it's dead second too. <laughs> yeah we'll see we'll see yeah for sure for sure for sure i say also i noticed that you're wearing a zelda t-shirt as well during this podcast yep. which... i'm a big game nerd man uh, just yeah. you name it um i've still owned all of the systems i've owned 
forever. <laughs> I've, I've still got all my old Nintendo systems. I have every console. I've got two Switches, Series X. Mm-hmm. I, f- I feel like that was really the OGs, like with Palmer Lucky and all, like everybody just seemed like such, it really was created by gamers. Yeah, yeah we were, I think, yeah, I think it's a natural thing. Uh, most gamers have really want to be inside their games you know particularly mm, yeah. 3D games. and that was a big thing for me like I, I would be happy with a lot of games just allow me to have a vr mode where i can just stand inside them just and have a and look. experience yeah. them right that, that, as simple as that like a world of warcraft there's so many a uh, big wow fan for many years and there's so many places in wow i was like oh it'd be so cool if this had a vr mode where i could just like <laughs> walk around or ride a horse there's oculus homes around. every every game should come with an oculus home i should say that but yeah, yeah. That, would, that would be you're right though if like for example zelda because you got the t-shirt on it's like if you went to somewhere like zora's domain and you could just have a vr mode where you could just have a look at everything it would be, it'd be awesome yeah i think the problem though is naturally everyone who are less educated about you know what doesn't doesn't work in vr um are gonna be in for a bad time <laughs> yeah. if they want to do anything more than like I, i've seen just recently Beardo banjo played um the red dead redemption 2 yes. mod uh in vr and i asked i've left a comment on asking about how nauseating it is with all of the camera <laughs> animations right um so uh he said yeah i've got a pretty strong stomach but yeah it's pretty pretty full on um and there's a third person mode as well where you can it just operates i guess like the third person camera in the game yeah. so you can rotate the camera around and stuff and i've got a reasonably strong stomach and i actually was that was the first you know game that has a mod for vr that i felt i'd like to actually check that out yeah. uh, red dead 2 i've got a 3090 in my pc so um, nice. I, sh- I should be able to crank it up for sure uh, i think that would be a really nice one to, to, to experience just yeah because you know it's a lot of a lot of a lot of people i think that's going to be a, a really powerful thing in the future uh, for a lot of people, and there are already experiences kind of like that where you can just go and sit in a rainforest and have, you know, that, yeah. that sort of serene kind of feeling, or the different times of day that you can get up, up on top of a mountain, or you know, some kind of nice atmospheric location. It's like feel. a meditation type of thing, you know. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, there are already those there. I just it'd be nice to get. Um, <laughs> it'd be uh, that would ever happen, but uh, you know, some way to hook up a fan and have the fan tracked so you could have the fan driven by the software to control the wind my friend it's kai has increase. been wanting wind in vr forever he's been talking yeah. to me about this for so long yeah and then and they capture that that smell of uh rain you know mm. you get that dusty wet smell that and then have that just sitting there i remember when i was playing uh first time i played um uh the climb yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the climbing game. Yeah. One night I was sitting here and I got to the top and I just sat down on my floor and I had a beer and I was just sitting there drinking the beer, sitting on top of this thing. I was like, this is really cool. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sean, I, I always like when it, when a developer comes on, the last question I always ask them is, do you have any advice for any aspiring developers? And the reason why I ask is that I know a few of our listeners are people who are starting to get in the VR scene or something that they really want to jump into. Um, what would be like just some a piece of advice for an aspiring developer for you? Tricky question because I think it depends on your level of experience mm-hmm. with developing software versus, you know, if you're an experienced developer coming into VR. Yeah. Um, uh, Aside from all of the challenges you'll face, just actually trying to get the budget and funding and money at least to be able to do, unless you can find, um, maybe you're working from home, maybe you're a student, yeah. you don't have any commitments, I don't know, but um, the you, you really need to learn all of the fundamental things first about, you know, play a lot of games. There's a lot of people out there talking about, you know, design challenges and things. There's plenty of resources out there now. You've got to really learn them before before you try and innovate, like try and try and a lot, a lot of people want to run before they've learned to walk. You know, it's, it's pretty common, particularly when you're young and ex- inexperienced, you've got a lot of passion and, and drive and, and motivation, but it, you have to learn all those foundational things to be able to, mm. to, um, to make that amazing thing that you want to make, you know, you're not going to go out and make an MMO before you've made, you know, a simpler game <laughs> yeah but it's just patience you know i think a lot of people um they want it now they want to be able to mm. be kicking goals 
today and it's patience is the most important thing to learn i think it's being being willing to walk the road and yeah. uh don't give up for sure for sure thanks thanks a lot sean this has been great i feel like we could continue for another hour but um i got the lights killing me here so yep. no, we, yep. we, we should we should an hour and a half now we definitely so we should we should wrap it up here but um don't sean thanks a lot uh for coming on the show that was really fun um do you have anything to plug obviously with dead second as well before you leave uh well i mean if you're aware of the game and you've played it um we'll, we're looking to release our next update hopefully middle of next month so um it's an exciting update so uh look forward to that and if you haven't checked it out please do so um, because get in before awesome. the price increase yeah. <laughs> exactly well um this is a uh, something we haven't locked down exactly what we're going to do with this update but we're actually going to raise the price but we're going to run a discount sale uh at the launch of this next release gotcha. so it will it will be on sale for a period of time uh, nice. when that update comes out Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. awesome thank you so much no yeah. worries guys thanks sam thanks dan thanks you're and, welcome. Uh, um, all the all the links will be in the in below in the description for Dead Second, and obviously where you can see Sean as well. Um, thanks everyone for watching and for listening on the show. Like I said, next Wednesday we'll be back for a normal episode of Let's Talk Oculus with all the news and such that you love. But um, thanks everyone. I'll see you then. Great. Thanks guys. See ya.